Well, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to the Love Broadcast today. Uh, it's Monday the 20th of June. Um, first of all, I hope everyone had a great weekend uh, and has got their week off to a really good start. And, um, and the way that I want to start today is I, I just want to take a moment to really thank everyone for their time. I know there are plenty of things that you could be doing. I mean, let's face it, it's Monday, right? The new Game of Thrones came out this morning, so lots of you could be watching Game of Thrones. But uh, here you are with me. So I really just wanted to take a moment, just really appreciate everyone's time. I know your time is precious. And uh, you know that you're giving me your attention. I, I feel pretty privileged about that. Um, today, what we're doing is we're, we're talking about the part two of the four things that no one's talking about when it comes to negative gearing. Uh, and today, there's what I want to talk about is how uh, abolishing negative gearing really isn't going to impact the, the ability of young Australians or particularly first homeowners to get into home ownership. It's been one of the things that's been talked about that negative gearing is what's uh, attributed to how, uh, you know, the unaffordable pricing of houses and it's what's stopping the younger generation from actually getting into home. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, obviously I just want to uh, keep you guys reminded as well that uh, you know if you don't like the Infinite Facebook page make sure you like it now. You can hover over the like button um, and select to get your, our notifications first so that way you don't miss anything coming up on uh, the Facebook page. You can stay in tune with all, all the uh, statistics and data, you know, all the, uh, the competitions, all the events, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and obviously up in the uh, top right hand corner of, uh, uh, of this video as well, which is probably somewhere up around about there, there's a, a button that you can press and click and that'll make sure that you're subscribed to our notifications so that you can see um, when we've got videos like this coming up and, and you can be informed and you can get on and you can get all your questions answered. A um, couple of things that I wanted to cover before we really get into this. Um, first and foremost, you know, why is it that I do this? Why am I spending my time, you know, having these conversations and why is something that, um, you know, the ability of the average Australian to get ahead, why is it, why is it important to me? Um, you know, I've also had some questions, maybe even you could call it some criticism about, uh, you know, maybe I'm wealthy or, you know, and that's why I'm having these conversations about negative gearing. And um, truth is, is this, you, you're probably right. I mean, I, I don't necessarily know how you define what wealthy is, but, uh, you know, I'm certainly doing pretty well for myself. I was able to retire at the age of 27 as a multimillionaire. Um, and one of the reasons why I care about this, why I'm having this conversation is there's just no way in hell that I would have been able to do it without negative gearing. Negative, without negative gearing, that would have, uh, that would have put in place a much higher or a much significant, uh, much more significant weekly cost um, on me owning an investment property. And there's just no way that I would have been able to, to, to buy those houses and continue to build my wealth. And be in the position that I am today. I mean, I, I grew up in you know one of the outer lower lower socioeconomic areas. Um, you know, we did it really really tough. And and for me, I, I just I had this you know I mean they tell you follow your dreams. Right? They tell you anything's possible. And for me, you know, after seeing my dad struggle, you know, when he lost his job when I was a teenager, and it took him two years to find work because we're in the middle of the recession that we had to have. Um, you know, I, I didn't ever want to be in that position. I believe every Australian has the right to be financially secure and, um, and even financially free. You know, be able to have the autonomy so they can live the life that they want to live, spend it with their family, have nice things, travel, go and see the world. You know, I mean, this, this thing called life, it's here to be experienced, right? It's not, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's not here to be spent, um, you know, working a job that you hate for, you know, 55 years until the day that you die. So, so it is important to me. You know, this the abolishment of negative gearing, and we talked about it yesterday, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, we talked about how an average income earner, if they're spending money uh, in, in terms of being able to build their income, i.e. they have a car expense, they can claim that car expense. You know, we're talking about a business. If a business is spending money generating income for that business, whether it be on, you know, computer equipment or on staff or on events or on marketing, they can claim that. But yet we're saying that a property investor isn't going to be able to claim the expenses that they're using to, to build wealth and build their income. It makes absolutely zero sense um, to me whatsoever. So today in particular, we wanted to talk about point two, which is how the abolishment of negative gearing will make absolutely no difference to particularly young Australians. I mean, we've, we've heard about how, you know, this may be the generation that might have to rent forever, how that's just gonna make really not much difference at all for them being able to get into a house. Now, why is that? I mean, look, one of the, the, the argument for why to, um, to uh, abolish negative gearing is that investors being in the market is what's driven up prices. So 
if the abolishment of negative gearing is meant to increase housing affordability, there's only one way that can happen. And they're assuming that investors won't get into the market, then what will happen is house prices will drop. So first and foremost, if you're a person that owns a home, that's what Labor are essentially banking on is their policy, that they're going to abolish negative gearing and that is going to see house prices drop across the board, making it more affordable for younger Australians to be able to get into the housing market. So, I mean, that for me is a major concern right from the start. But let's, let's talk about these first homeowners and how, how in particular it's going to affect them. Now, I did drop some stuff like I did last week, but the only problem is when I show it on camera, it shows it reversed. So I'm just going to um, walk you through it. And I've got two examples here that I wanted to walk you through. One was in Western Australia and one is in Victoria. So in both cases, what we're going to do is look at a $500,000 house. Now, you should know, first and foremost, the Australian median house price is over $600,000. And that's ABS stats from December quarter of last year. So I think $500,000 is not a bad place to start. Uh, and it's not uncommon, and you know, I see it all the time, it's not uncommon for first home owners to spend that much money on, um, on, their, uh, on their first home. So let's say they're gonna take uh, a buy a $500,000 home. Well, if you go and speak to all the different banks out there, you know, pretty much the best, uh, best deal that you're gonna be able to get and the best deal that you're gonna be able to find in terms of a deposit would be a 5% deposit. Now, obviously, the bigger the deposit, the bigger the amount of cash that you're gonna need to, to get into your own home. So. Most lenders out there will take 5% deposits from uh, particularly first homeowners, so we're going to talk about that. If you're buying a $500,000 house, you're talking a 5% deposit is $25,000. So that's straight off the bat, they're going to need $25,000. But then we've got to can take into consideration the other charges, the other costs that a first homeowner is going to have to pay. So you've got $25,000 for the deposit. If you put a deposit uh, in with a bank, and it's less than 20%, that bank's gonna require you to take out mortgage insurance. Essentially, it's an insurance policy that the bank takes out against you as a risk. However, it doesn't cover you and you have to pay the cost of that policy. Now, across most of the large banks, mortgage insurance for a loan of around that amount, you'd be talking around about the $15,000 mark. In fact, some banks would charge more than that around about sixteen or $17,000. So we've got our $25,000 deposit. We've now got another $15,000 in mortgage insurance. That's before we pay stamp duty. So this is a government tax that uh, the state governments require you to pay in Western Australia, stamp duty, and this is taking advantage of the current incentives offered to first homeowners. If you're not a first homeowner, this could be anywhere from around about eighteen to $25,000 in both Western Australia and Victoria. If you take advantage of the incentives that the government are currently offering, in Western Australia, you'd be able to pay uh, um, uh, $4,000 in stamp duty in Victoria, it would still cost you around about uh, $10,000 in stamp duty. So we're still talking a lot of money, right? Now, settlement fees, pretty much across the board, you're gonna be paying $3,000. So if we look at that as a comparison or a place to start, so first of all, you've got your $25,000 deposit, you've got your $15,000 worth of mortgage insurance. In WA, you got $13,000 uh, in terms of um, stamp duty and another three thousand dollars in terms of settlement fees so what we're talking about there is effectively we're talking what, what's that we're talking thirty one thousand plus twenty five you're talking um, fifty six thousand dollars that someone's going to need to be able to secure a home on five percent see this is the actual thing that's making it uh, really hard for first home owners to get into the, the into the market. You know, the fact, simple fact of the matter is they need to come up with such a large sum of cash to be able to buy their own home. It's not the house prices, okay? In fact, you know, we were talking about the National Australia Bank Affor Affordability Index, which came out last month. You know, they were showing that right now, it's only costing the average Australian 30% of their income to pay for a mortgage, whereas if we go back into the late 80s, it was costing the average Australian over 43%. Okay, so it's not the mortgage itself, it's the deposit to get in. Okay, now, um, uh, if let's say house prices were gonna drop 10%, so rather than being a $500,000 house, it dropped to a $450,000 house. Well, straight away, Sorry guys, my alarm went off and cut me out for a second, reminding me I've gotta to go to my chiropractor after this. Um, so, what we were talking about is if, say for example, Labor got their policy in for abolishing negative gearing and it had the desired effect which makes, makes houses more affordable. Now, 
um, let's assume, let's, and let's go over the top, right? Let's, let's um, pump this number up so we can see that, really put it into perspective. Let's say that the abolishment of negative gearing and the implementation of that policy saw house prices drop by 10%. So this first homeowner is no longer looking at buying a $500,000 house. That same house after a 10% drop is now only worth um, 450. Well, does the deposit change much? 5% of 450 is compared to 5% of 500,000. You'd see only a $2,500 saving in terms of the deposit. So, you know, $2,500, that's not really, uh, really going to help people that much. Okay, next thing, mortgage insurance. You really only see the drop in the mortgage insurance by around about $1,000. So we're now only talking $1,000 savings. So we've now got in total, we've saved $3,500 that you need to come up with in terms of a deposit. Stamp duty. Well, the saving there, because it does drop under the threshold for the West Australian government, you would see a $9,000 saving. So that, that's pretty significant in, in Western Australia. The same thing in Victoria, um, because the incentives are different in Victoria as compared to Western Australia, you'd only see a $3,000 drop in terms of what you need from a stamp duty point of, view, point of view. And the settlement fees would remain the same. So effectively what we're looking at there is in Western Australia, where for a $500,000 house, you would have needed $56,000, you're now going to need, what's that, 10, minus 12 and a half, because the deposits dropped, because the house prices dropped, the stamp duties dropped a little bit, the mortgage insurance has dropped a little bit. So still what it's going to require for a, for a first home buyer in Western Australia to get into a home is we're still looking at $44,000 they're gonna need. So we're going from $56,000 down to $44,000. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think that's um, really a significant drop. It's gonna make, you know, I mean, how many people have $50,000 lying around? Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's not gonna impact a first homeowner's ability to get into the market. If we look at, uh, in Victoria, the savings nowhere near as much because the, uh, the stamp duty incentives aren't as much. So over there, you're really only looking at a saving around about $6,000. So once again, you know, this core argument that we've seen out there that, you know, the abolishment of negative gearing is going to make housing more affordable. Well, first and foremost, it's going to mean that everyone's house prices are going to have to drop to make it more affordable. And then secondly, because, um, because what's making it uh, unaffordable is not the mortgage payments but actually the money that first homeowners need in terms of the deposit, in terms of the mortgage insurance, in terms of the stamp duty, in terms of the settlement fees. There's really an insignificant drop in that amount so it's not going to make it any more achievable for first home homeowners to get into the market. So you know once again I think that, that it, it pretty clearly throws out that argument that um, this is what's going to help the next generation uh, of homeowners. Um, just also a reminder, last time we talked about um, uh, you know, the principles, how a, a wage earner is able to claim the amount of money that they're spending on, um, you know, like as an example, if a, a normal wage earner is using their car to generate an income, they can deduct that on tax. We talk about business, if they're buying business equipment or hiring staff or spending on money on marketing, they're able to, uh, they're able to deduct that on tax. Um, you know, why wouldn't that apply to a, uh, a, a property investor as well? So, you know, that kind of really wraps it up for me today here, guys. You know, this is, uh, this is the second thing that, you know, people, or well, no one's really talking about when it comes to negative gearing. Um, this is an issue that I'm very, very passionate about, um, you know, primarily because, uh, because this is what's enabling, you know, everyday hardworking Australians just like you to be able to build their wealth and get themselves out of the rat race and into a position where, you know, they might actually be able to afford to retire at some point rather than having to rely on a pension, which, you know, if you make up a partnership, you're talking $13,000 a year each. And, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not far off of that's not even being available until the age of 70. And, of course, you know, because of the way things are going, we're going to see that retirement age creep further and further, uh, further, and further out. Um, once again, just touch on a couple of things, you know, to make sure that you, uh, you stay up to date with all the videos and, uh, you know, click the little button that's up there and you can subscribe to our live broadcast so you make sure you don't miss out on anything. Um, I've got two more points that I want to cover with you guys over the next few days. Uh, probably going to do something maybe uh, on Thursday and then follow it up with the final one uh, maybe Monday next week. Uh, also, you know, we've been getting lots of questions and 
um, and also other issues that people want to talk about. So if there's certain things that you would love me to talk about in these live broadcasts, uh, please make sure that you, you post something uh, in either the comment box, something on the Infinite Wealth page. Uh, you can tweet me, you can Instagram me, you can Facebook me. Um, if I get those requests, I'll make sure that we cover those things. You know, these, these are for you guys. We want to make sure that we deliver as much value for you and, and get all your questions answered. If you don't like the Facebook page, the Infinite Wealth Facebook page, please get up there and, uh, and click like. You can hover over it and select get our notifications first. Um, that way, you know, anything that we post on our page, you can be sure that you won't miss it. Uh, in the timeline. Guys, it's uh, been really great spending time with you today. I hope uh, I hope your Monday's been a good day. I know Mondays not, aren't normally too much of a fun day for most people, but uh, I also hope that what I had to deliver for you guys was um, was valuable and you enjoyed watching this, uh, this live broadcast. Uh, and I look forward to next time. Thanks for being with me, guys. Speak to you soon. Ciao.